Hello. Thank you all so much for joining us for this first session of our series of webinars to commemorate World Antibiotic Awareness Week 2022. This year, the theme for the week is preventing antimicrobial resistance together. This theme recognizes the importance of the contributions of all stakeholders if we are to make significant progress and win this fight. At the Ghana College of Pharmacists, we are wholly in agreement with collaborating with all stakeholders in this fight. It is for this reason that we have scheduled three webinars, this series of webinars, and we are focusing one on pharmacists, one on community members, and one on the healthcare team. This first webinar is targeting pharmacists. Our expectation is that as we go through these discussions, our high caliber panel will inform and inspire us to infuse our daily activities with the nuggets we receive today. We have with us pharmacist Dr. Mrs. Martha Jansa Lutrot, a former director of technical coordination at the Ministry of Health Pharmacist Dr. Daniel Niamu Ankra, Director of Pharmacy, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Pharmacist Dr. Mrs. Joycelyn Aziz, Director of Pharmaceutical Services, the Ministry of Health. And Pharmacist Professor Kwame Ohene Boabin, Vice Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, KNUST. We hope that pharmacists will bring, will be empowered to share their knowledge with their clients and other healthcare professionals and utilize their skills to improve antibiotic use. As you can see, our resource pool for this session is phenomenal. And all the facilitators are well-versed in matters relating to antimicrobial resistance, antimicrobial use, and antimicrobial stewardship. And I might add, I must add, that all of them are fellows of the Ghana College of Pharmacists. They will share with us these gems that they have picked up along the years with their practice. And then we will have the opportunity to engage them during the questions and answer session. So get your pens and papers ready. Indeed, now with internet, just get your fingers ready to, to start typing your questions into the chat box when the time is up and pay attention and let's all be inspired to contribute our quota to the global effort to prevent antimicrobial resistance together. I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you, pencil it in your calendar that we have two more sessions, one on Monday 21st and the other on Thursday 24th. Join us in all these sessions and let's together 
put our shoulders to the wheel, fight on, and contribute our quota to the success story when it comes to antimicrobial stewardship and the fight against antimicrobial resistance. And so with that, I'll hand over to pharmacist Dr. Brian Asari, who will take us now and introduce our guests properly and moderate these sessions for us. Take over, Brian. Brian, I believe you are muted. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Yes. So um, thank you, Yvonne, for this. And I, I know that um, this will be a very interesting session. Um, looking at the panel that we have, um, very experienced people in the area of antimicrobial resistance and what the role of the pharmacist really is. Um, to get right to it, um, our first panelist is Dr. Daniel Niamo Ankara, as mentioned, farm doctor. And he is a trained uh, pharmacist, and he's also an epidemiologist with a specific focus on pharmacoepidemiology. Um, he's a researcher in antimicrobial use in humans, pharmaceutical policies, economic evaluation of medicines, benefits risk of medicines. And that also include vaccines as well. Of course, he had his um, bachelor's level training from KNUSD, followed that up with a master's in epidemiology from the London School of Health, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he has a PhD in pharmacoepidemiology from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, he has done some work with Ohio State University as a postdoc, still in the area of pharmacoepidemiology. And um, he has several publications in the area, um, well-decorated academician. And um, he is currently the director of Pharmacy Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Um, Dr. Daniel Ankara, um, you have the audience. Thank you very much, Brian, for your brilliant introduction. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, for that matter, um, hello everybody, because it depends on where you are in this day and age. <clears throat> and I'm very happy uh, that you have me for this evening. In 1736, an American president called Benjamin Franklin made a statement that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Little did he know that today, what he said will be what we'll be chasing in every aspect of public health. Today we are celebrating how to deal with antimicrobial resistance. And our theme, like was said earlier on, is preventing antimicrobial resistance together. The One Health approach of antimicrobials involves humans, animals, plants, and the environment. As hospital pharmacists, our role is predominantly in the area of human health. As hospital pharmacists, we play ver various roles in achieving the, 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 the in, in helping to achieve AMR prevention in this area. One of the things we do is to go on periodic ward rounds with other members of the healthcare team. And as such ward rounds, we preach de-escalation of antimicrobials where patients are put on uh, IV lines or um, injections. We advise them where it's possible to bring them to orals. There are cases where we advise them to reduce the doses. And there are situations where we even ask them to stop treatment altogether, depending on the situation. But I want to let all of us know that antimicrobial resistance exists because there's antimicrobial utilization. Without utilization, there's no resistance. As members of the Drug Diabetes Committee in the hospital, 
we contribute actively in the selection and monitoring of antimicrobials in the hospital. Here, we use the AWARE process, where AWARE means access an antimicrobial depending on its importance, weight for a particular antimicrobial because of its strength, and reserve some because of their importance. We also participate actively in, in, in infection prevention and control. Here, the hospital pharmacist of Ramata, the clinical pharmacist in the hospital, advises on the choice of disinfectants to use in the hospital to prevent hospital acquired infections. Here, the hospital, the, the, the hospital pharmacist is also a cost cutting person in that he prepares hand sanitizers using the WHO formula, which are very affordable and can easily be prepared at any time. Hospital pharmacists also work hand in hand with medical reps who come over to talk to us and advise them on the choice of antimicrobials to uh, advise to clinicians. The pharmacist is also a counselor, a patient counselor, and he plays active roles in adherence and compliance of antimicrobials uh, among patients. A typical examples are in the areas of TB, where pharmacists uh, indulge in the, the, the direct operation therapy among patients to, to, present, to, to prevent multi-drug resistance TB and initial drug resistance TB. In the area of HIV AIDS, also pharmacists, for that matter, clinical pharmacists play significant roles in advising patients to adhere to their treatment so as not to cause anti antimicrobial resistance. Even in the area of COVID, we have played significant roles in the hospital. The hospital pharmacist is a member of the antimicrobial stewardship team of every hospital. And here, there are, the, he plays an active role in all the seven core areas of antimicrobial stewardship, namely leadership, accountability, drug expertise, action, tracking or surveillance of antimicrobials, reporting on antimicrobials and educating the public on antimicrobial use. In fact, hospital pharmacists are very much, they are, they are, in fact, they are pivotal in the use of antimicrobials. They liaise with people, I mean, workers at the lab to ensure that the right things are done so that we get things going. The hospital pharmacy is also an antimicrobial researcher. Here, he takes part actively in point prevalence surveys of antimicrobials. He actively researches in the area of antimicrobial utilization, utilization and also in surgical prophylaxis. He's the person who does most of the work when it comes to monitoring. And at this juncture, I will plead with MOH. I have I identified that uh, hospital pharmacists can even do better, especially in the area of therapeutic drug monitoring. But so far, we aren't doing much in this area. For uh, at least amino glycosides and glycopeptides, we need to do something. And I will plead with MOH to at least get one chemical analyzer for all the five teaching officers, the pharmacy department, so that they'll be trained and they will help in reducing antimicrobial resistance even better. The pharmacist is a member of the antimicrobial sentinel site in the hospitals. And here, he plays the role of advising other members on the usefulness of um, working well when it comes to anti antimicrobials. He is an implementation scientist. When all the policies are done on antimicrobials, it is at the level of the hospital pharmacist that these are implemented. 
And so he does so much to make sure that things get better when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. In conclusion, I will say that the also pharmacist plays a very significant role in the One Health approach. And as such, we need to help to ensure that we deal with this menace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ankara, um, for that concise and um, very informed presentation uh, that you have just made. Um, next on the panel, uh, to continue, we have Professor Kwame Ohenebuabin um, from Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, KNUST. Um, Professor Buabin will be speaking to the role of the pharmacist in the antimicrobial resistance battle, and he will be addressing the perspective of the community pharmacist. Um, a brief about Prof. Buabin. Prof is a clinical pharmacologist and a professor of pharmacy practice at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, right here in Ghana. Um, he is also the vice president of the Ghana College of Pharmacists and then the chair of the Division of Pharmaceutical Care. He's also the deputy chair of the multi sectorial, multi stakeholder coordinating platform for antimicrobial resistance in Ghana. Um, it doesn't end there. Prof is also a member of the National Medicine Selection Committee. Uh, that's the committee that is developing and updating our standard treatment guidelines as a country, uh, as well as the essential medicines list. He trained his, in his bachelor's um, with KNUST, followed up with a master's in clinical pharmacology from Aberdeen, um, the UK. And then he also had his PhD in Finland and Prof has done a lot of research in the area and he has demonstrated um, passion in the area of antimicrobial resistance. And um, Prof, you are welcome. Um, the audience is yours. And thank you very much, um, Brian. And thanks for the kind uh, introduction. I think that the topic that we are dealing with is a topic that is very, very dear you know, to, to me uh, because antimicrobial resistance, as we are all aware, it's a very serious public health menace, um, you know, worse than COVID. I mean, we saw the effect that COVID had, um, you know, on the economics, you know, across the, the globe. But the problem of antimicrobial resistance, which is a silent pandemic, you know, uh, it's much more serious, you know, than the, the effect of COVID, the impact of drug resistant infections on the individuals with suffering, usually very serious infections, um, and the problem of, because of the problem of antimicrobial resistance, sometimes untreatable or very expensive to, to, to manage, you know. Um, I mean, it's a menace that can actually aground, you know, the entire health system with serious economic impact, you know, on society. We saw when the COVID virus was mutating uh, and the challenge that we're having, you know, even with the selection of medicines, you know, for dealing with it. The problem is much worse with antimicrobial resistance. Now we're looking at the role of the um, community pharmacist. Um, we know that the pharmacist is a very responsible um, health uh, professional um, who is an expert, you know, um, on medicines, expert in advising on medicines, you know, advising on utilization of medicines, you know, and also has a very my my, my other colleague has talked about the role of the pharmacist uh, in the hospital. Now I'm looking at the community. In the community, um, the community pharmacist is highly regulated to ensure and assure the health and safety, you know, in the societies in which um, they are placed. The community pharmacists operate for long hours, um, you know, uh, and also has very good relationship and link, you know, with the clients, with the attend to, uh, and then also the various um, health um, um, the, the health community, the various um, healthcare providers, you know, um, within the, the community. Now, antimicrobials is a very essential. These are very essential uh, medicines you know, for use in the management of infectious diseases. And as my other friend has established, you know, the resistant exists, you know, when use is 
not optimal, um, you know, in, 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 inappropriate or irrational. The community pharmacists have a role to ensure the rational use of antimicrobials within the community. First and foremost, because these are life-saving medicines, they ensure their availability and access when needed, because these are life-saving um, medicines. But most importantly, also to ensure that these medicines are used rationally to minimize the risk of antimicrobial resistance. Often, um, you know, it is well known that, especially in our part of the world, the problem of, um, you know, access, I mean, antimicrobials can be accessed anyhow, anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But the community pharmacists have a responsibility, and he has a responsibility um, to ensure that now these medicines are only uh, recommended for use when um, needed, and then ensure you know ensure that clients, right, or people who you know visit them for the use of these medicines actually um, use them um, appropriately. As I said, antimicrobials are controlled medicines. So these are medicines by regulation that are supposed to be supplied um, on prescriptions. And it's the responsibility of the community pharmacist to ensure, you know, that, you know, this is not, I mean, people really access these medicines when an appropriate prescription is, is available, you know, for a request for the use of these medicines. It doesn't end there because the pre prescriptions are evaluated even to assess if there is the need and then also to check that you know the antimicrobials are you know will be used in an appropriate way uh advise the, the clients you know i mean when the, the the medicine have been selected advise the clients how it should be used and the relevance of using this medicine so that you know they can show that the outcomes that is intended or required can be used there are some antimicrobials you know which uh by virtue of their classification like anti-malarials etc the pharmacists are very well known. I mean, the training of the pharmacists enabled them to really interact, you know, with the, the, the clients, all right, to ensure that antimicrobials that are needed are actually supplied, you know, in such a way that, you know, the use is responsible to minimize the risk, you know, and the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So some interaction is actually done with the clients to establish that there is really a need for antimicrobials you know, so that it is used appropriately, you know, um, to uh, ensure. Um, and as I, you know, um, indicated, in fact, the pharmacists have a very huge public health responsibility. Um, and, and by virtue of the training and the expertise, that is the reason why, you know, they are available within the communities to work with, you know, other health care practitioners to ensure other responsibilities that the pharmacists play um, or role that they, they play to control, uh, to ensure a control um, of the problem of antimicrobial resistance is creating awareness about the menace so that uh, people do not just use antimicrobials anyhow, but use them. And also the, 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 the consequences of irrational and irresponsible use of antimicrobials and the impact of antimicrobial pharmacists actually as part of their public health education is supposed or are do educate the public you know uh on on some of these i think i would want to end here for now and, and perhaps during the question time uh during the interaction i'll probably throw some more light on it thank you very much thank you prof Bobby, um for that concise um brief on on amr uh, from the community perspective um this is getting interesting and i can't wait um to have the cross-cutting issues uh, being spoken to and also to hear questions from um, the audience so next we have um the role of the pharmacists in antimicrobial resistance in the antimicrobial resistance battle the perspective of the ministry of health um, if you pick from the previous two speakers, you realize that um, there were a few lines there, uh, some of them being recommendations or um, questions to the Ministry of Health. And um, to help us speak to this, we have Dr. Mrs. Joycelyn Aziz, who is the Director 
for pharmaceutical services um, at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Aziz um, trained as a pharmacist with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. Um, she furthered to do a postgraduate um, work in supply chain uh, management. In fact, she's a certified global supply chain manager. Um, she furthered with an MBA from the University of Ghana Business School, and then she has also um, acquired for herself the Doctor of Pharmacy um, certification, still from KNUST. Um, she has actually done a lot of work in the supply chain in Ghana, and over the years, if you have heard about supply chain reform, um, some of the names that are mentioned would definitely include um, Dr. Aziz. Um, if you look at a lot of the reforms that we've done in Ghana, um, Dr. Aziz has been very instrumental in establishing supply chain um, system strengthening um, in the country. So, Dr. Aziz, um, we are ready to have you. Um, if, yes. So Thank you. you have the audience, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, and good evening, all. Thanks to the earlier speakers. So what is the role of the Ministry of Health in the fight against this menace called antimicrobial resistance? Um, I think the ministry plays a motherly role and so comes in to look at issues of AMR from a policy perspective. As you would all know, Ghana has an antimicrobial policy. And this policy, I must say, was developed with the Ministry of Health as the, how do I say it? Like the Ministry of Health has actually led the process of the development of the AMR policy. We don't only have a policy, we also have a national action plan that sets out how we intend to implement our antimicrobial policy. The role goal of the policy is to improve and sustain the health of the population, as well as to enhance food security, also, and also to ensure the responsible use and access to safe, effective, and affordable antimicrobials of good quality to slow the emergence of resistant microbes and to prevent the spread of resistant infections in the One Health approach. And I would like to dwell a little more on the One Health approach because that is where the ministry's efforts come in. So as I said, the ministry plays a motherly role in the sense that it sets the policy and it also has the responsibility of ensuring, ensuring that it provides leadership and um, enables collaboration amongst all relevant stakeholders within the One Health approach. The One Health approach simply means that we are looking at all sectors. So basically, we are working with both international stakeholders and local stakeholders. With the local stakeholders, the ministry works with the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology, MESTI. It also works with the Ministry of Food and Aquaculture Department, MOFAD. And of course, it works with the Ministry of um, Food and Agriculture. Ministry also collaborates with international agencies like the WHO, World Health Organization, the UN Food and Agri Organization, and also the OIE, that is the world body that's responsible for animal health. And so ministry's role basically is to ensure that we work with all of these partners. But to be able to explain how the ministry, what particular role and how the ministry plays its role in ensuring that we fight this menace that, I, that we all call antimicrobial resistance, it's important to understand the governance structure of the implementation plan. Like I've said, we have a policy which has been developed by a multi-stakeholder group, as I have outlined. There is a governance structure that seeks to um, give direction as to how the plan will be implemented. So we have an interministerial committee made up of representatives from all these ministries that I've mentioned. So we have the ministers of all the institutions that I've mentioned, the ministries that I've mentioned. We have um, the CEOs of their agencies. We have the focal persons. We have 
um, reps from all of these and the ministry works with them in a one health approach to ensure that we implement the policy. If you, for, those, for those of you who are familiar with our policy, section eight clearly indicates what role the ministry will play. And it says that we shall, that the ministry shall coordinate a functional multi-stakeholder platform. So as part of the governance structure, apart from the interministerial committee, there is a vibrant and a functional AMR antimicrobial resistance platform that is made up of everybody that matters, all relevant stakeholders. We have um, all our um, reps from all the various ministries as I've outlined. We have the media represented the people from the poultry industry, um, fisheries. We have almost everybody that matters within this platform. And this is where we share information, we judge all together, we try and ensure that everything that needs to be done to fight this menace is done through the platform, the very vibrant platform. And I know that another speaker will speak on this. So as part of the governance structure, we also have technical subgroups, working groups, which the ministry also coordinates and collaborates. And um, Dr. Ankara rightly said that she's, he expects more from the ministry. I must say that your concerns have been heard and we'll address them. So the ministry plays a coordinating role the ministry also is responsible for the development of the policy. We have a five-year policy which is about you know, to end. It has just ended. So it is our duty to coordinate the development of a new policy, a revised policy. So what are we doing now? We have uh, working with a consultant to ensure that we assess the implementation of what we've done over the five years. And this would inform our next steps in developing or revising the policy. The idea is that we look at what we've done over the years and then learn from what we've done and improve upon it. So the ministry is, as I said, plays a coordinating role, provides leadership and ensures that we work with everybody that matters to fight this menace. Basically, this is what the ministry does. Thank you very much. I think I'll end it and then when it's time for questions, we'll have the opportunity to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Aziz, and also for enlightening us on the perspectives from the Ministry of Health, um, speaking to the policy issues and the strategies and the One Health approach, that integrated uh, approach that is globally uh, recommended for in the fight against AML. Thank you so much. Um, next we have the role of the pharmacist in antimicrobial resistance battle and speaking to this um the focus will be on the national platform on antimicrobial resistance um there's no other person to help us than the former director technical coordination ministry of health our own well-known dr mrs martha jansa lutroth Dr. Jansa Lutroth is a health policy analyst with specialty in pharmaceutical policy. In fact, she has over 35 years of public service uh, in the management at the management level. Um, she's a product of our own Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. She pursued further studies in health policy from Leeds University in the UK. And then she also pursued um, further policy um, training and governance training in leadership and governance from our own um, institutes of management and public administration in Ghana. Um, she also has the doctor of pharmacy certification from KNUST. And she has a very uh, unique um, qualification, which I, I like to mention. And she has a master of arts in ministries from Trinity um, Theological Seminary. Um, her association with the kingdom of God business is also significant. Um, she's an expert member of the WHO Expert Committee on Medicines Policy and Management, and also um, the Medicines Pol uh, Patent Pool in Geneva. Um, she has several pol publications in universal health coverage, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, Doha, declaration and related matters, access to medicines. And for the sake of this work, we emphasize her work around antimicrobial resistance, both in Ghana 
and then across the globe. Um, she has done some work with Lancet infectious diseases. And then she even has some work that she has done pro bono with the African uh, Palliative Care Association. Um, Dr. Luttrell has played a key role in the West African Postgraduate College of Pharmacists and has also um, been at the helm of affairs for years when it comes to Ghana's actions on antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Luttrell um, is married to Manfred, Reverend Manfred Jansa Luttrell Esquire with five children. And um, you understand the connection to the ministry. So audience, you have Dr. Jansa Luttrell. Um, Dr. Jansa Luttrell, you have the audience and we are delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much. Um, I am very um, happy. Uh, I think uh, my other um, uh, colleagues on the panel has already addressed a lot of the issues. And uh, my job is to speak to the um, uh, part of the governance bit of uh, what we did in Ghana. Uh, I must say, I must recommend the Ghana College of Pharmacists for taking antimicrobial resistance as a World Cup and uh, pushing it to the level. I think uh, Yvonne and your team, congratulations for putting this all together. Uh, I believe that the next couple of days uh, is going to be exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say um, uh, th thank you for having me to speak. Uh, I keep telling uh, anybody who invites me to speak that, look, I have retired and I thought that we have done something but couldn't finish and whatever is left is being done by others. But suffice to say that um, antimicrobial resistance began uh, some way back uh, with just a commitment from uh, young people and people who are just committed to do something to what is happening in our country. Uh, we be, our first meeting, I think, began on, a, it was a, a Valentine Day at a, a hotel in East Legon. Uh, we just put a few people together to ensure that uh, we get a, a, the strama type of uh, group that can be looking at this. But this grew, it grew very well. And um, now we, have what we call the Ghana Antimicrobial Resistance Platform. Of course, we took a lot of advice from academia and uh, research institutions. Uh, at this point, I would mention the University of Ghana and also uh, my revered university, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, uh, for the research work that they did that informed the policy. I must say that the policy and plan we have today is a product of the hard work of the platform uh, that is the antimicrobial resistance platform. And in terms of uh, um, the structure of how antimicrobial resistance need to be implemented in our country, uh, we, we are supposed to have a secretariat uh, which is working well. And then we have the coordinators uh, from all the other ministry departments and agencies. Then thereafter, we have uh, what we call the platform. We have the partners. Uh, I wish I could share my screen, but my video is not even coming. So uh, I couldn't. I wanted to share with you the, the governance bit. But what did not work too well is the ministerial governor, call it the political governance that drives the processes. Uh, we only had our minister pushing, our minister for health pushing, and uh, the other ministers uh, lagged behind a bit. Uh, but I can tell you that the technical commitment of members had been very, very useful. And uh, that is what has really kept the platform alive. Now, coming back to the topic and the discussion, the role of the pharmacists in the antimicrobial resistance, I try to give a historical account. I must say that there are five areas or thematic areas of the plan. The issue about stewardship, the issue about um, uh, surveillance, 
the area of investments and research, the area about infection prevention and control. And I will say that a lot has happened within that sphere, especially when it comes to infection prevention and control. And uh, the various thematic areas also really played a very lead role. I must say also that the WASH uh, experience in our facilities has contributed a lot to the infection prevention and control. And thank God for COVID as well. Uh, because then the whole of last year, we never heard of cholera uh, because people are mindful of how they have to wash their hands and all that. I want to quote from uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados, who is the, uh, uh, the co-chair for the Global Leaders Group uh, when uh, he la they launched the group that is the highest governance for antimicrobial resistance at the UN. And one thing she said that really very powerful, he said that it is important we harness the same agency, the same innovation, and the same solidarity uh, as we did for COVID to confront AMR because it is a silent epidemic. And during the epidemic, we, during the pandemic, we saw uh, how people were taking antibiotics left, right, and center. It is important that pharmacists will rise up to the challenge, whether you are in the community, or whether you are in hospital, or whether you are in the ministry, or whether you are in industry. The role of the pharmacists in combating the antimicrobial resistance is very key. What are the elements that really put together the platform to be going? And I must say that this platform has birthed several projects. And I can say with confidence the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association uh, was birthed with several uh, publications that is available for our use. We also have the WHO Sort It, uh, which is uh, people are publishing uh, based on the work they are doing. And it is so amazing. These things were never in the system at the time uh, that the program began. We can also see that a lot of uh, documentation uh, is now going in, but I think that pharmacists can do more. We can do more by documenting and uh, uh, doing good data that can inform the type of things we do. Currently, we are asking for a review of our policy. But where are the data? I'm sure the consultant, if he's been called to come and speak to us, she will tell you the challenge she was having, getting enough data to back some of the recommendations. It is important that we take these aspects of our uh, call to action very seriously. Again, I must say that a lot of teamwork uh, went to, into it. We try not to be abrasive. We try to be accommodating to everybody to ensure that the veterinarians are on board, the academias, you know, uh, the, how it surprised me that the academia uh, brought their gowns to town. That is to say that they left their ivory tower to come and join us in our meeting. Sometimes when they listen to us with our arguments, uh, it's amazing, but they accommodate us, Prof. You, 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 you really, um, uh, you know, show that uh, you are really passionate about this to to take up the mantle of becoming a co-chair or a deputy chair for the uh, platform. And I must also say that uh, these alliances are working well. Another area that the project, uh, the platform has birthed is a diagnostic study, which is ongoing in Dodua. And I am glad that uh, at a point in time, this will be shared among us. But I think that there's a lot that we can do. These days, nobody is looking for one-way traffic projects. We must be willing to combine with other professionals, the, the, the laboratory uh, scientists, um, to ensure that uh, we are getting value for money proposals that can ensure that we get projects that keep going. 
because our governments may not be able to support or provide the funding we need to implement the action plan. I think I will pause here because I realize I have spoken for about six to seven minutes and I will pause to take questions when it is become necessary. I thank you very much for the opportunity and I pray that uh, we will all work together to ensure that antimicrobial resistance battle, we fight it and make sure that uh, we can bring it to uh, the lowest uh, levels uh, because uh, ev it must be everybody's business. It's a global, complex matter and everybody must get involved. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. And Mrs. Jansalutrot, for that um, straight to the point um, rendering of what has happened in Ghana over the years when it comes to our fight um, against antimicrobial resistance and um, highlighting the need for data, um, the role of teamwork, highlighting the role of the interministerial structures that have been set and the initiatives that are going on in terms of diagnostics. And um, we can't thank you enough for all the efforts that you have made in the, over the years when it comes to um, setting up as a country to fight antimicrobial resistance. Well, audience, if you just joined us, we are still on this webinar um, that is addressing the role of pharmacists in the battle uh, or in the antimicrobial resistance battle. Um, we've heard from our panelists and we want to move on to um, delve into details of some of the content that has been pre presented. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and then we would see it. And then the panelists would help us um, address some of those questions. Um, in going into this, we want to start building our discussions around um, antimicrobial resistance. And maybe um, I would start Prof Wabi, if if Prof is with us, um, I would start with, we have heard about this whole antimicrobial resistance and largely this audience is a professional audience, but we really want to hear from you, Prof. I mean, with all the work that you've done in this area, um, really this antimicrobial resistance has been with us and what really is that phenomenon and um, how is AMR detected? I mean, it's quite an abstract concept, but then how is it really detected? What is it? What is AMR and how is it detected, Prof? Prof, I think you, you are muted. If you could unmute and then um, so we could hear you. Right, thank you very much. You, you are very, very right. Um, I tried to even do some work on the university campus to find out if people know what antimicrobial resistance is. And, and people really did not know what antimicrobial you know, resistance, you know, uh, well, and that's part of the, the problem. When we say antimicrobial resistance, um, we are talking about a, a phenomena where microorganisms that is responsible for causing infections, communicable diseases, you know, um, become resistant or fail to respond to antibiotics or antimicrobial agents that are used in treating these organisms. What happens? The organisms change their nature. So otherwise, these life-saving and effective medicines that are effective for treating them all right, destroying them, killing them, the organism change, and because they change their nature, that these drugs are not able to destroy them. And when they are not able to destroy them, it means that, you know, they make the infections worse, and that is part of the problem. And then the infections spread. And then it means we have to look for much more potent medicines to be able to, you know, deal with this. So, you, you have a situation where, um, you know, and for example, I mean, in our health system, 
where you have a lot more people getting very seriously sick, a lot more resources going into, you know, um, trying to solve the problem that these sick people have. And to the extent that, you know, these days, um, we are even having a challenge, you know, having uh, effective medicines to deal with some of the, some of the infections where the organisms have become multi-drug resistant. It's a very serious issue. But we have lost a lot of very productive life. And there are a lot of people with experience. When we say antimicrobial resistance, we are talking about a phenomena, which is a natural phenomenon. The microorganisms would want to live anyway, and then, you know, uh, what do you call it, remain uh, in, in the system. But a, a phenomena where, a situation where the microorganism um, becomes resistant the, to odd, if drugs that were otherwise effective against them. So the organisms now become resistant. Now the, the drugs are not able to treat them. They are not able to destroy them. And then they entrench and then, you know, they cause worse uh, infections. Um, the fear is that if you are not careful, untreatable infections, and sometimes we have some of them. Let me take a particular example, tuberculosis. There is a, a particular type of TB called extended spectrum drug resistant TB. If somebody gets it right now, it is a very serious problem. You know, the whole society is at risk. Not only that, WHO has classified certain um, microorganisms as critical pathogens. If you are not careful and you get infections from some of these organisms, big, big, big problem. I mean, if you are going to go through caesarean section and you have an infection from these back, ordinary caesarean section will end up in death. Ordinary but, oh, yes, yes, just a quick one. So, I mean, I like the trajectory that you are on. And um, I know we you defined antimicrobial resistance um to us and you've broken it down into into very um, simple terms for all of us to appreciate now i just wanted to find out in terms of the detection because i mean this is a very um it's not a very uh, it's, it's an abstract concept so to speak and how how is this thing detected because i mean as thank, we go about our way, brand. Thank you. Very good question. So detection, it comes in several forms. Um, the most pra uh, practical and objective one is the lab, you know, where um, you do culture and sensitivity tests, and then you are able to detect that, you know, the, um, the microorganisms are resistant to a range of antibiotics or antimicrobial agents that are used in treating them. That is one aspect of it. But sometimes the sad and the worst aspect of it is situation where, you know, people are sick in the hospital where, you know, maybe this test is not done and you know that this is their common infection and this is the type of you know, antibiotic or antimicrobial agent which you should use in treating. And then you realize that you, 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 you give the optimal dose all right, but the patient is not getting well and it happens a lot and sometimes they change the treatment you know, to another antimicrobial agent, and yet you are still not getting resistant, uh, not getting um, cure, or the patient is not getting well. You know, sometimes these are some of the ways that these are detected. And sometimes when doc doctors uh, or the clinicians, the clinical team, when they realize this, that is when sometimes they are prompted because in their frustration, they change this one, change this one. I have seen a situation where a patient is sick. The clinical team came in the morning, change the treatment to a certain antibiotic team, patient is getting worse, the condition is, you know, worsening, the team came in the evening, changed the, the treatment, it is getting much worse, etc., etc. until, you know, uh, somebody decided to take a sample for culture and sensitivity, and then they realized, oh, you know, the organisms are multi drivers this is the antibiotic that can be used, and sometimes we are lucky when we change to the right antibiotic, we get a response, but oftentimes, you know, we detect this too late, and we lose a lot of very, very productive life through that. In fact, some colleagues have lost their uh, close relatives through that. I don't know Thank if- you so much. Yeah. Yes, I think you, you have nailed um, the, the issue. And actually that, that sense, because you did mention things that happen in the hospital setting, 
um, for us to see resistance really at work. And that sends me to Dr. Ankara. Um, Dr. Ankara, so, I mean, building on Prof's point, um, we also know that in the hospital, we actually see some of these infections that people get from maybe resistant bacteria or something like that. But then it's actually from the hospital, okay? And not that they actually brought infection um, into the hospital, but some also come from the hospital. So in that regard, we just want to find out um, what really are healthcare associated infections or what people would call uh, hospital acquired infections. And if, if in, in elaborating that, you could also uh, link that up with, with the whole antimicrobial resistance concept as Prof has also explained. Dr. Ankara, I think you are muted, so if you could unmute. Um, sorry, sorry you. about that, Brian, but thank you very much. I will say that hospital acquired infections involve those infections that patients who come to the hospital without those infections end up getting the infections. It becomes clear that these infections were only acquired by the patients from the hospital. Sometimes we call them nosocomial infections. But then getting hospital acquired infections involve a lot of things. It could be that we do not have a good infection prevention and control system in the hospital. So we are not using the right antimicrobial, uh, the, the right uh, disinfectants to take care of the place. You know, for a hospital, you need to clean the surfaces. You need to make sure that areas are all taken care of. Hostels, hospital walls should be well ventilated and have netting so that mosquitoes, for instance, will not take the advantage of biting patients because that could also lead to infections. Now, in the theaters, we realize that after surgeries, nobody cares about who cleans the place. But we need to seriously train our orderlies because they do this work. We don't value their work, but that can lead to serious consequences of, of hospital acquired infections. So these are some of the uh, very simple things that could lead to infections. Then the last and I would say most serious one is irrational prescribing. Like Prof said, hostel, I mean, uh, anti, uh, anti, antimicrobials are supposed to, use, to be used in a particular manner. So if you don't use them in that manner, if for instance, uh, you are prescribing amoxicillin, it's supposed to be 500 milligrams uh, three times a day for seven days, and you prescribe it four times a day for 10 days. In a way, you are creating something that may lead to another thing tomorrow. So irrational prescribing is also a very important thing. And that is why, as pharmacists who work in the hospitals, we are supposed to notice these things and advise prescribers to prescribe rationally. I think I would, I would, I would, I would end here with this question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ankara, from the, for the hospital perspectives um, to this. And... Um, Probably you can hold on the thought there um, on your inputs regarding the whole resistance concept because I think I'll come back to you again um, about matters relating to so what is really happening to these microbes that are making them um, resistant. Uh, Prof, you can hold on the thought whilst I move to um, Dr. Jansa Lutro um, to give us some perspective. We know that she has done a lot um, in the area of vaccines and all that because whether in the hospital or whether in the community i mean people are getting infections and some of these infections are with resistant microbes and we have heard that vaccines have a role and uh, we just want to take some perspective from dr jansa lutrot on what vaccines do when it comes to um antimicrobial resistance over to you dr lutrot Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that uh, what the uh, Professor Boabing and Dr. Ankara talked about are the human causes, human and clinical causes of um, 
antimicrobial resistance. But there are other uh, causes which are the, um, the, you know, microbial resistance is not just about uh, bacteria. It's also about viruses. It's about fungi. It's about parasites. And so all these are coming together. And it is also uh, about whether we have the tools to manage um, uh, these uh, uh, microbes. Public perception and behavior is also one of them. And one of them will be uh, when we talk about vaccination, uh, when uh, people like just gone is COVID vaccination. Uh, in, in, initially, everybody wanted to get a vaccine. The vaccine is not available. People, uh, vaccine hesitancy came in. And what that happens is that we were not able to get the herd immunity we needed. And therefore, um, we are, we are, we, we still have, uh, and the fact that the, the, the virus itself, or the, the pandemic, or the virus itself, the COVID uh, virus has kept on uh, mutating. And so all these are coming together to give us the resistance we are talking about. That is why uh, we are talking to pharmacists and uh, we are encouraging them to be part of what the vaccination processes that have been put in place uh, so that pharmacists will be part of the, uh, the vaccination processes because they are in touch with the community. They can explain to the community better to deal with the vaccine hesitancy issues and to ensure that people understand why they get vaccinated uh, so that they can avoid some of these uh, uh, infections. I must also say that uh, it is just not about only the public perception and behavior. It's also the ag agricultural uses and applications. Key areas like uh, the food that we put on our table. I know WHO has done some work around um, the tricycle project, uh, which can tell you that uh, the bacteria that is flowing in our water bodies is not easy. Uh, the type of uh, 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 Things that we are eating on our table, the fact that our our uh, salads are all laced with uh, a lot of uh, resistant pathogens, are uh, worrying. Uh, the fact that we are not doing well, especially with uh, the fisheries, and uh, how that we are the growth hormones are also playing roles in the way we. Uh, handle our food and food substances. And of course, uh, commercial pressure is also one of them. When people uh, want to uh, sell everything uh, to the extent that uh, fake uh, antibiotics or fake antimicrobials are sold uh, uh, anywhere and anywhere. But we must be thankful that we have a very agile regulatory body in our country uh, that is at the regulatory maturity level three. And uh, with that, we can we can sleep a bit uh, that they are watching over us. We all heard what happened in Gambia. Of course, it's not related to antimicrobial resistance, but it's related to uh, infectious diseases and children taking pop mixture. So vaccine reluctance and vaccine hesitancy uh, has a role to play in the uh, uh, the resistance agenda that we are talking about. In the same vein, that we may as scientists, as pharmacists in academia, in research, find a way of bringing in new products. And I will recommend highly uh, Professor Amani, uh, who is working on onion as an alternative for uh, TB treatment. I believe that once we are able to support uh, such projects, uh, we can get value for money from our researchers to ensure that we have some uh, products in the pipeline. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lutro, for that those insights. And um, it 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 it, it sends us, I mean, to ask the question that um, with all of these initiatives around vaccines, we trying to prevent uh, or control hospital acquired infections and all that. Um, some of the data also indicates that the resistance rates are increasing. And this actually sends me to um, Dr. Aziz. Um, 
I mean, as professionals, I think it's also important that we want to get some insights into. I mean, really, why are these resistant rates still increasing? I mean, from the presentations we heard about the policy instruments, the action plans that the ministry has put in place, and all of that, plus all the initiatives that we are discussing. Um, what is really making these resistance rates um, continue to rise? Um, over to you, Dr. Abi. Thank you very much. I think um, this is a very important question, and it br this brings me back to the One Health. It appears most of our efforts are concentrated in the human health. Meanwhile, as um, some of the earlier speakers have alluded to, antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance actually is found in all of the sectors. It's found in animal health, in our fisheries, poultry. So I think um, a lot of our, uh, efforts are concentrated in human. As um, Dr. And Mrs. Jansalutrod rightly said, COVID came and we realized that because we were improving upon our infection prevention control systems and actually practicing them, we didn't have cholera. The whole of, since 2019, we haven't had any outbreak of cholera and other infectious diseases. And so this points to the fact that if we really concentrate our efforts, I mean, if you put in as much effort as we are putting in health in other sectors, such as the agri, the environment, the fisheries, etc., we'll be able to um, bring down the risk. So I think we are not getting the decreased rates of AMR incidence or prevalence because we are concentrating our efforts in just the human health. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, of course, I think with that, we also learned from the presentation of Dr. Jan Salutro that the intersectorial um, governance structures also needed some level of strengthening. So I think that dovetails or aligns with the, the point that um, we need to get the same traction in other ministries um, and other sectors to, to help us move this agenda forward. Okay, so thank you for the initial round of uh, uh, discussions. We are moving on to also discuss matters relating to um, consuming or consuming antibiotics and related matters. Um, if I want to start, maybe I'll look at Prof. Wabing, um, coming back to you. Um, you did give us some of the background issues when it comes to what resistance is and then how it is detected. But then can you also, I mean, help us? What is that single most important driving factor that is increasing these rates that we have just discussed? I mean, Dr. Aziz talked about the intersectoral things not working, but I mean, if we, all those factors, if you want to single out one single item, what will be your pick? Right. Um, I think the, the biggest problem is um, unrestricted access and irrational use of antimicrobials in the animal health sector, in the human health sector. Even though Mrs. Aziz said, you know, I mean, some progress have been made in the human health sector, I still think there are issues. I mean, if you look at our health system, quite a number of the facilities are not able to do, the, their laboratories are not so strong to be able to do culture and sensitivity to kind of guide the, um, the selection and use of antibiotics for infectious disease. But you asked me um, a question and I wanted to throw some more light on it. You know, you asked me a question about, you know, how the organisms develop resistance and I think it's a very important question. These are very smart um, living organisms that we are dealing with, and, and there are diverse ways. You know, sometimes they form a film around um, what they call it, the membrane, all right, biofilms, which makes it difficult for the antimicrobial agents to penetrate and destroy them, because antimicrobial agents act via several mechanisms, like either breaking the cell wall, you know, entering, interfering with metabolic activities, synthesis of protein, you know, other things that makes the organism, you know, thrive or survive, you know, intercalating the DNA, et cetera, et cetera. But when they form these biofilms, it makes it difficult, you know, for the, what they call the drug to enter. That is one. The other mechanism is that they develop a flux pump, 
you know, develop a certain mechanism of pushing out the antimicrobial agents around them. Well, all of these things are also targets. So scientists are also working to see how best they can circumvent this. And then the other thing is that, you know, these microorganisms share a lot of information among themselves. So they share the resistant genes, you know, um, you know, and then that is how come you have multi-drug resistance rates. And that's why the caution from antimatter about, you know, the, the way antimicrobials are used, you know, the, the, how they are disposed of in the environment, used in animal health, in agriculture, et cetera, is very important. Because then you have us getting exposed, you know, to microbes that already have the resistant genes because they are in the environment and they are sharing these genes. I think one popular um, a problem which we are dealing with globally is a certain kind of uh, microorganism that you know have developed enzymes that makes it easy to break a number of um, antimicrobial the extended spectrum beta lactamases producing you know and if you are not lucky and it's actually becoming a problem even in our health system you have an infection from one of these mostly most of the microorganisms responsible for the healthcare associated infections or the hospital acquired infection have these urinary tract infections several of the laboratory findings esbl producing there is a warning that even with gonorrhea if you are not careful the way the resistance has spread if you are not careful we may not have antimicrobial agents. They also go through mutations. You know, they, they go through mutations. So I think back to the question that you asked me, the whole thing comes about the controls around, you know, the use of these antimicrobial agents. In fact, they have to be used only when it is necessary. All right? If we are able to deal with that in all the sectors, I think we'll be able to, kind of stem down the tide of antimicrobial um, resistance, Brian. Thank you so much, Prof, for that. And I think that actually uh, sets the agenda for us in terms of the discussions around use of, of antimicrobial agents. I mean, if, if we emphasize that use is or abuse um, is the main issue, um, we have also heard, and I'm coming to Dr. Ankara for some insights on this. Um, we have also heard, or let's say uh, we've heard some speculation uh, that, and some have argued that actually completing antibiotic uh, regimen actually contributes to resistance. And is this a fallacy? Is this true? Is there any uh, factual accuracy in there? Um, maybe we'll just fall on Dr. Ankara from a clinical um, angle to help us demystify this. Um, the question is that some have argued that completing antibiotic regimen actually contributes to antibiotic resistance. And um, Dr. Ankara, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, yes, Brian, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and I will speak generally on this because before any medicine comes into life, research is done from bench to, bed, to bedside. If I say bench to bedside, I mean before humans and in humans. So we all know of clinical trials in humans. Phase two trials, what we refer to as a proof of concept, is where we go through serious uh, research studies to identify if the drug can work or not. And then after phase two trials are completed, using very good and expensive procedures. We go on to do phase three trials where the drugs are used in large populations to find out how they would work. So drugs don't just come to market by chance. Regulators don't just register drugs because somebody wants to register them. They register them based on pure evidence. And even after registering the drugs, after giving the marketing authorization, they keep on monitoring such drugs for future effects. So to say that completing a drug, the course, 
can lead to all kinds of things may not be very right. I do know, however, that people have personal idiosyncrasies. And just because you have one, you may react to a particular drug. That doesn't mean that is the nature of the drug. We have some subgroup of people. Pharmacogenetics is teaching us that some people could be slow metabolizers, while others could be fast metabolizers. And so in such subgroups, you may have deviations from the ordinary. It doesn't mean the drug is not doing its work. So I would say that based on pure evidence, before drugs are registered by the regulator, uh, the period assigned to antibiotics that is to be taken is right. And it should not be something that will frighten anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ankara, for that. Um, of course, on this particular series of questions, um, if any of the panelists have an input, you can you can actually chip in on this. Um, yes, I, I want to add to what Dr. Okay. Ankara has said. You know, no, I mean, if antibiotics are recommended for a period of time, right, adequate concentration, that is good enough to destroy the organisms for a duration which is able to eliminate the organism. Another problem of resistance is that when the, the drugs are exposed to the organism and you don't eliminate them, all right, then the what they call you have resistant mutants developing. But if the concentration is good enough to eliminate them, you know, then you know the organism will not have a chance of developing resistance. So rather if you are not able to complete the duration of treatment, that is where the the, the chance of resistance is high. And there's a lot of documentation on this with TB and many other anti-microbial um, um, agents. You know, so that is um, one thing that I, 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 I want to add to um, what he has said. Thank you, Prof. Bro uh, yes. yes, Brian, if I may add. Yes. I, I think it's also very important that our community pharmacies, they play a key role in this very um, discussion that we are having. Even in the hospitals, we have a lot of people going to dispensaries and because they are hard pressed with time, they just give the medicines to them without necessarily telling them how long they're supposed to take it. We as pharmacists have a key role to play in this area. The two earlier speakers have spoken to the issues of the need to complete the regimens. So I just want to use this medium to appeal to us pharmacists both in, at the hospitals and the community pharmacies to ensure that we give them the right information, particularly with regards to how long the duration, because most people take the medicines two, three days, they feel better and then they leave it. And for reasons that Prof has explained, we get to increase the incidence of AMR. So I'd like to use this medium to appeal to our pharmacists to do their needful, not just for antibiotics, but indeed for all the medicines that we dispense. Thank you. Yeah, Brian, this is a very, very important. Maybe I also want to add. So the problem is overuse can cause resistance. Yes. Underuse, all right, can cause resistance. And then irrational use and abuse can cause resistance. And, and these are all um, issues. The pharmacists have the responsibility to ensure that the antibiotics are responsibly or rightly used. If that is the case, then we get good outcomes. If we establish the need and it is rightly used, you know, then, then we will get the right kind of outcomes. People will do well, and the problem of antimicrobial resistance is minimized. Then let me also take you to, you know, um, another issue. Dr. Ankara was talking about idiosyncrasies, what they call it, drug reactions, and all of that. That is why you don't just give the drug. You, you look through the profile of the patient and the pharmacist, you know, also has a big role in this, both hospital and the community pharmacy. Interact with the patient and get to know allergies and other problems that they have. People with certain kinds of diseases may not take certain of antibiotics. It will make their problem, you know, worse. People with liver diseases, you have to be very careful about some antibiotics that are given, that an alternative has to be given. So we are there, you know, to ensure that we support the, you know, the entire clinical team plus the clients that we deal with to make the 
best of these very important and essential you know molecules or medicines right to improve their health and minimize resistance great great thank you so much for the for the inputs there and i think this subject of uh, use is is still very critical and i would like to um take one uh myth buster again then we take uh, an input from dr jansa lutrod on what we should do with unused or expired um antimicrobials we are still talking about use and we are talking about when we have to use them but when we don't have to use them and maybe they are expired what do we do to that whilst um dr jan Saluto comes in with that i still want to go to dr ankara um about the second myth that we want to take some perspectives on so dr ankara um there's also some um perceptions about common cold and then antimicrobials uh, the use of antibiotics um really from from therapeutics and all that do antibiotics have any role whatsoever do they even help when it comes to common cold thank you very much you're talking about antibiotics and common cold the question is what organisms really cause common cold in our system it's not bacteria it's normally viral so giving antibiotics in the treatment of common cold may not be rational. That is all. I, 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 I wouldn't go far. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ankara, for that concise answer. Um, again, if any other panelists want to contribute to that, you can. But I'm quickly yeah. going to... Prof, you have an yeah, input? Yeah, yeah, something small. So it also adds to, the again, the selection of resistant mutants. Because, you know, I'm sitting my somewhere, you know, I don't have any problem with you. And then you start introducing antibiotics, you know, I'm, I'm a normal common, every common cell, these are organisms that live with us, you know, they are not causing any problem. And then you start introducing antibiotics to it. I'll find a way of resisting. And, and that also happens a lot with overuse of antibiotics, all right, in common code. It's one of the major causes of um, antibiotic resistance, especially for the upper the microorganisms, you know, that usually are found in the upper respiratory system. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Now, on matters relating to when we haven't been able to use the antibiotics, what do we do with them? Um, we want to take perspective from Dr. Jan Salutrot on this. Um, okay. Salutrot, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think... Uh, um, it is something that happens in our homes, in our offices, uh, in our communities. And uh, I must also admit that the Medicines Policy 2017 provides a lot of guidance regarding how uh, uh, medicine, uh, spine medicines or unused medicines must be disposed of. But I think that the Public Health Act, Act 851, uh, also provides a lot of uh, uh, regulatory guidance as to who must dispose of them. So throwing uh, our unused antibiotics or medicines through the drains and through the fields is adding up to the resistance issues that we are finding medicines in our uh, uh, lettuces and uh, we are finding medicines in our water bodies. Uh, we are finding uh, them uh, everywhere. So I, I think that uh, what I would recommend is that we should uh, move the policy uh, notch higher uh, to ensure that people can return. We can provide a system where people can return their unused medicines to the facility. I know Dr. Edward uh, Ampofo at Coco Clinic had done a lot of work uh, where he had established a system where people can bring their unused medicines. And I think that we can, we can, we can learn from that uh, system and ensure that we expand it to other facilities, that we uh, encourage people to bring, whether we like it or not, uh, you will give all the advice, complete your medication, take it uh, timely, timelessly, the times that we, we advise our patients and our clients 
but some way, somehow, some uh, unused medicines will still be at home. So we encourage them to bring it back to us so that we can get the regulator to dispose of them appropriately. Because honestly, some of the uh, unused medicines could be biologicals, and um, it, we cannot just go and bury them because then we are affecting everything, the ecosystem as well. And so the regulator, uh, when I say regulator is the FDA, uh, they have the mandate to dispose of medicines expire medicines throughout this country. And so let's work together to ensure that we we are working with each other. Uh, I think the ministry can encourage the uh, community pharmacists and other hospitals to establish a system like what is at the clinic to people for people to bring in their unused uh, medications, including antibiotics. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lutroth. And um, for that, you start Yes. If I may add, okay. this is a very, very, very important part of the supply chain. Just as we go through laborious processes to procure, we must also go through due process to dispose of unused stores, as we say, in this case, medicines. And I want to particularly give some information on how the Public Procurement Act, the provisions that we can find in there for disposal of, they, they call it stores, and medicines are part of the stores especially for those in the public institutions, okay? So for those at home, for those within the hospitals, you can send them to, you can encourage your patients to bring the medicines to you, but when they are brought to you, what do you do with them? For instance, assuming you are at a regional medical store and you have, so I would like to start from that level. The law clearly stipulates what to do. You're supposed to constitute what we call a board of survey which is supposed to be made up of the head of the stores, the pharmacist in charge, and someone from the FDA, and you have to quantify. And I'm talking about huge stocks of expired drugs, for instance, at the regional level. <clears throat> from this body of survey, their mandate is just to ensure that they are able to um, indicate each medicine that has expired, the reason why it expired, and also the quantity. And then last but not the least, the value. When this is done, the FDA is written to, and then they would come and do the need for. And this is done with inputs from the Environmental Protection Agency. There's a whole process for doing this. So I just want to use this um, medium to um, educate uh, people, particularly those within the health system, the health sector, the public sector, to be informed about these processes and comply. And I would add my voice to Dr. Mrs. Jansalu Schultz to encourage people at the hospitals to do what, um, emulate what um, Dr. Edward Ampofo has done. That is to encourage people within the communities to bring their expired medicines to them so that as an institution, they'll go through the process to dispose of them. Thank you very much. This is one thing that we don't pay attention to, but it's causing a lot of problems. Um, I read recently about um, the disposal of mosquito nets. They are not medicines, though, but we call them health commodities. You know, mosquito nets, the insecticide treated nets. Improper disposal of that has caused a lot of problems in some countries with regards to the quality of the fish that people are eating. And so, disposal of stores is very, very important, particularly with medicines. You could even have throw them in your bin. You could have some people, you know, you know, people go through dustbins looking for all kinds of things and. If they come across it, they will take them. And that will also result in an increase in the AMR. So the proper disposal of medicines is of key importance when it comes to AMR. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Brian, may I just add something small to Mutita uh, uh contribution? It's, it's, I mean, she has been very specific on public sector, but I think the private sector too Mm. Uh, have this issue of expired medicines. Yes. Have we ever asked ourselves, how do the private sector dispose of their uh, expired medicines? We all have expired medicines. So they are also involved and we should uh, address it as such. Thank you very much. Thank you so like much. I said, just, for them, for them they are supposed to send them to wherever they procure them from. For instance, if you bought it from a warehouse, you're supposed to send it to They in turn will go through due process, invite FDA to come and dispose of the stores. 
Right. So for, uh, for the but, private sector, it's a very simple process. But with the private public sector, it's an elaborate process because you are talking volumes. So thank you for the, right. yeah, for bringing my mind right. to the omission. There's also a system right. for the right. private sector. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, really wonderful um, suggestions and inputs, you know, from there. But um, Aunt Mata, you know, mentioned something. I, I, I want to reinforce that if it is possible, if there can be a system, you know, where the community pharmacists, uh, you know, what they call it, um, also um, that kind of cocoa, cocoa, um, or clinic structure. Really? Yeah, start collecting maybe a policy or something, you know, to encourage the community pharmacists, you know, uh, you know, to start collecting um, unused and unwanted medicines, you know, for disposal. Yes. Okay. So great inputs, I mean, across the panel. And um, we just want to give ourselves the opportunity and our participants also the opportunity to give us, um, uh, throw in some of their questions as well. I'm told that we have a few of them. Um, so um, Yvonne, I think if we can have some of the questions from participants, that would be great at this point. Or maybe whilst we 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 wait for that to come through, um, we quickly want to take perspectives. You know, we've talked about this whole um, resistance and antibiotics and all that. Um, maybe Dr. Aziz, if if you have some thoughts on this, I mean, why can't we just get more antibiotics if the old ones have started, um, you know, failing and not working the way they should? I mean supply chain issues and can't we get new supp uh, supply new molecules and new um drugs into the system and that will give all of us some peace of mind i mean we have more powerful drugs and that's it thank you very much unfortunately it's not that easy <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of research and development to be able to come up with antibiotics and it's also very expensive and so it's not that easy the, the least or the best we can do is to preserve what we have because coming, coming up with new alternatives entails a lot. And already we are operating within a limited risk. We are resource constrained. I mean, even globally, it's not easy. And so my admonishment is that let us preserve what we have rather than look to having alternatives. It's not that easy. Thank you. Yeah, add to Mrs. Asif. She actually nailed it, you know. It's a very, 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 very expensive um, process. But even that, if new antibiotics are brought into the system and it's also not, you know, well utilized, organisms will develop resistance. Of course, I mean, efforts are being made to get new antibiotics. And let me also mention um, Professor Ohimin's work. Actually, he has actually worked to uh, introduce some of these new molecules for drug resistant uh, infections, so metacycline, is tetracycline. So some work is actually, in, but if we get new molecules and we don't use them appropriately, you know, we'll still have resistance. And just to add to that, most of these uh, newer molecules also come with serious side effects. And so that's also of great concern. So back to what I said, let us preserve what we have by using them rationally so that we would decrease the, or reduce the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Thank you. So, panelists, we have some questions in the queue. Okay, sorry. Um, is there a thought coming through? Yeah, I know. I was going to say that uh, if you have new molecules, the cost alone may be a deterrent, and yeah. governments may not have the money uh, to go in for new products, although that is uh, what the citizens would like. Uh, so, it is important that we preserve what we have. And use medicines rationally. Thank you. Great, great. So what I'm going to do this for the sake of time is to blast three questions across the panel, and you can choose any that you are comfortable with to to respond to. So we have three questions that I will just throw across. Uh, one from Edwin Panford Quino, and his question is on. Uh, in relation, it's in relation to the national action plan, and it's very specific. Okay, so in relation to community practice, what lessons have been learned since the launch of the NAP 
that would be applied or that will change or yes that will change anything in the next nap and i'm sure that maybe he's aware that the policy is being reviewed and we've alluded to that in the presentations so he's asking for any lessons or yeah that have been learned in the area of community practice that will be applied in the next nap that was the first that's the first one um we also have one from isaac naughty who is asking how can we be able to control the use of antibiotics when OTC sellers are now hiding, hiding, hiding and selling antibiotics? And the, the emphasis is mine when it comes to the hiding. <laughs> 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 then we also have one from Edwin Mensa. And then he says that he has reviewed a research article by Prof. Babin. So Prof. Babin, this is a, a love <laughs> note for you. <laughs> So he's reviewed um, one of your papers on situational analysis of antibiotic use and resistance that was published in the BMC 2017. And the conclusion of that article was the absence of a national policy, weak regulatory environment, and non-adherence to standards may have contributed to increase and in unregulated access, which is a catalyst to spread AMR. And his question is, five years on, what has changed? in the policy and regulatory space. OK, so uh, maybe I, I want to start with the one that uh, was referring to the situational analysis. And if you listen to Antimata very well, it was one of the important um, work you know, that actually uh, birth or contributed to the development of the policy. At that time, we did not have anything. But since then, a lot has, a lot has happened. And I think several, you know, we've seen a very significant uh, improvement. Now we have a policy in place. Uh, there's a lot of awareness creation almost every year. Um, there's a lot of activities, um, you know, now even in the, in the area of the animal health sector, a lot is actually ongoing. Work is now um, uh, through the effort of the WHO. They're actually developing uh, biosecurity you know, guidelines to minimize the use of antimicrobials in poultry. So, so much um, has happened. There's a lot of um, significant um, improvement, you know. And I have to credit um, Mr. Sivia Yeguche for that paper. Um, you know, that was the work that he did. I just um, contributed to supervision, you know, um, of the work. The, the um, issue about the first question, I think Brian was on the community and what they can do um, in controlling the um, overuse of antibiotics, if, if I'm right. And I must say, since the launch of the National Action Plan, again, going back to G, uh, PSGH, working with the CPPA, you know, uh, and the entire community farmers, I think they've been very, very active, um, you know, trying to educate the public about irrational drug use. I think this year, you're going to see some of the activities that they are enrolling, even though we still have some some more work. Maybe we want to urge us to continue to step up and 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 continue with our efforts, restrict the use of antibiotics, only supply when there is a need for it through prescriptions, etc. Um, the issue about the regulatory space, we have seen some significant improvement also in the antimatter talked about it. Um, the FDA, you know, um, even um, Pharmacy Council is doing their best, but there's still a lot more, and we have to continue to work with them and ensure that this thing. So, weak regulatory environment, that's uh, one of the things that is contributing to under the counter, you know, so talking about over the availability of antibiotics, you know, um, under the counter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that is, is a question of regulation. Uh, it's very, very challenging. It's a question of, you know, stepping up regulation to control that. Now, pharmacists, we also have to stop supplying antibiotics to these OTC sellers. If we stop giving them antibiotics, they will not have antibiotics, you know. So pharmacists, wholesalers, uh, and all of that, let's stop supplying antibiotics to people who are not supposed to, you know, supply antibiotics to the public. Thank you. Can I you. add something? Yes. Okay. Dr. Ankara. Yes. Uh, to 
the question two, that is how can we control these OTC, OTCs from uh, doing what they are not supposed to do? I think, first of all, they have to be engaged. And engagement should be continuous. It should not be just one-off. It should be continuous. Secondly, for those who are found culpable, there should be severe punishment that will serve as deterrence for such activities. One, such punishment should be to close them from operating altogether. When we do not put in interventions, nothing will happen. Albert Einstein has said it. If we keep on doing the same thing all the time, we will not get different results. So we should be seen to be doing different things if we want results. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ankara. Um, I'm sure that the under the counter could be synonymous with hiding and selling. Um, if if I got it right, Prof. And uh, thank you for your absolutely right <laughs> on how we could um, address that. I think there's one final question. Um, after which maybe panelists can give us some one minute um, conclusion of, of their thoughts on the discussion so far. So that question is from Martin. And Martin's question is, he said that, please, my question is that I wanted to ask, um, the EPA has got a role to play in the disposal, or has the EPA any role to play in the disposal of pharmaceutical waste? Currently, is it FDA that is in charge of pharmaceutical waste disposal or the EPA? Yes, so that is the question essentially. Thank you very much. So the EP, um, the disposal is actually done by jointly by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drugs Authority. So it's a joint activity. Okay, there's no way that distraction or disposal, I would like to use the word disposal of medicines will be done without the involvement of the EPA. So when the board of survey, as I said, is being con um, convened, the EPA always has a rep, okay? Yeah. I just want to add yes. something to that. Uh, what I've noticed at Kolebu is that after the inspection of the expired pharmaceuticals, the EPA gives a certificate Yes. for destruction but it is fda that carries out the destruction exercise in uh, collaboration with uh, epa and then the, the stakeholders so the epa first gives a certificate that you should dispose of the things and they do that because Supervised. of the environmental protection you should do it at the right site not just at any other place so that is why the, the two are very important. Thank you very much. Let me just add that they are required to be part of the process. Apart from issuing the certificate, they're supposed to supervise the disposal. Okay, if you are not doing the right thing, it's another thing altogether. But they are required to be part of the team. They're supposed to supervise, like I said, the actual disposal. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I think it has been great. It has been exciting. Um, we could talk about microbes and antimicrobial resistance the whole night. And I know with your passion and energy, um, you would still have and depth of knowledge. You also have a lot to, to share with us. Um, but as we begin to round up, we we want to take go around the panel and if there are any thoughts on the discussion so far um just a minute uh comment from panelists and this one i would say ladies first and i would start with dr aziz um and dr aziz as you even share with us um you could also maybe throw a few thoughts about um how we can prevent infections in our communities and what the role of the pharmacy should be i mean that if that is part of your summaries that will also be appreciated uh, but any last minute thoughts, Dr. Aziz? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to say thank you to Ghana College of Pharmacists for this opportunity. It's, it's, it's been a nice opportunity to educate ourselves. So what can, what can we do to reduce the infections? 
COVID taught us a very, very, very important lesson. Simple things, IPC, washing of hands alone can help reduce, I don't have the statistics, but to a very great extent, just um, frequent washing of hands can help us. If you are sick, uh, keep indoors. When we talk about anti, in the past, you used to say antibiotic. Now we say antimicrobial because we are talking about fungi, fungal infections, parasites. We are talking about bacteria. So let's stop spread the infection. If there's no infection, there will be no need to treat, left alone, to misuse uh, or not treat appropriately. That would give rise to the, anti, the AMR to start with. So simple things. Cleaning of surfaces, particularly in hospitals, is very important. Dr. Ankara spoke at length on this. People go to hospitals to seek care and then come back with one or two more infections. So all the things that we're doing during the COVID times, let's continue doing them. And once we avoid the infections, of course, we reduce the incident, the need for even using the antibiotics and therefore would we'll reduce the incidence of the AMR. I think this is what I have to say. And I would like to urge us all as pharmacists to, to take this menace, this elephant <laughs> called AMR. It's a huge menace and globally people are struggling. So let us, as pharmacists, take this very seriously. Let us encourage ourselves at the least opportunity. Let's do whatever we can to ensure that we decrease the incidence of AMR. As we always say, brighten the corner where, we, where you are. Let us, in our own small way, contribute to the fight against AMR. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz. And um, I still want to continue with the Ladies First agenda. So that means that we have Dr. Jansalutrod to give us her concluding remarks. And Dr. Jansalutrod, as you do this, um, if you share your thoughts with us based on a comment from Alex Sefa, who wants to know um, how can we make this whole collection of expired medicines easy um, when it comes to the role of the FDA in, in all of that? So over to you, Dr. Lutra. Okay, I will take that one, then I'll give my closing remarks. I think that uh, it's a regulatory mandate of the FDA. You cannot do without them. It is their job to ensure that they dispose of uh, expired medicines. And so whether it is expensive or it is uh, cumbersome, we have to find a way around it. And that is where I think that the ministry can provide some guidance and leverage uh, uh, among providers so that uh, these can be collated. Maybe uh, small, small clinics can come together and uh, have one so that the FDA can just come and pick it from them. Of course, you have to pay something uh, for for what they do, uh, because it's, it's part of, they have to come with a vehicle, they have to come with people, and so you don't have a choice, and it's their regulatory mandate. So I, I would say that pharmacists have a responsibility to assist in the war on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, why am I saying that? Yeah, I'm saying that because they, they have the knowledge and the resources at our fingertips to raise the awareness and to act. I must also say that there are several and multiple opportunities for pharmacists to assist in this campaign. And I would add by sending a word of appreciation to the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana for their consistency. Uh, ever since we raised the issue of antimicrobial resistance, every year they take it up. And they, they started distributing flyers long before today. And I think that um, uh, if you are a pharmacist, you must be proud that the, our mother association has taken this and is mobilizing all of us to do something. And uh, I, I must say that uh, they deserve a loud applause. I thank you very much. And for this uh, particular uh, webinar, thank you, Kogana College. Uh, I understand there is two more others coming up. Congratulations. It's not easy to put things together, but you have done this one. And so subsequent ones will be easy. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Over. Thank you so much, Dr. Jansaludro, for your final uh, 
uh, recommendations and picking one of the critical questions on disposal. And I, I heard you loud and clear that as for the disposal fees, we don't have a choice. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we want to take from Dr. Ankara um, and Dr. Ankara, as you give your concluding remarks, there are two questions that came through that relates to the collaboration between um, doctors and pharmacists when it comes to prescribing of antimicrobial. So you can add that to your concluding remarks uh, for us. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, with regards to doctors and pharmacists, I think it's about a continuous bridging of our relationships. It's about how we work together. You don't just go on the ward one day and start talking to a doctor to de-escalate an antimicrobial uh, prescription or if you are there with him all the time, he gets used to you. Look, there are times that they ask for us because of the interventions we make. So we should be there with them continuously. That is why we have skewed this discussion to clinical pharmacists. In fact, we are not just in clinical pharmacists, but hospital or ward pharmacists should be there every ward round, we should be there. And that is the only way they will appreciate us and they will listen to us. Because when you talk and talk and talk about the same things, they will also go and find out and see that, oh, after all, look, doctors today know that pharmacies that they are working with are different people. Not like the 50 years ago pharmacist who was subservient to the doctor. Today, the PharmD person, the pharmacist who is working with the doctor, is a good guy. And he's helping them make informed choices. Now, what I have to add, as my closing remarks, first of all, I'll thank Ghana College for this innovative uh, exercise. But I'll say that it looks like World Antimicrobial Awareness Week has always been left with the public sector. This is wrong. Manufacturers of medicines are involved. Uh, private sector, they are involved. Uh, Arepi, they are involved. We do contact them, but they should all be seen to be part of this work. It will make it rich and more national. It shouldn't be left in the hands of only the public sector, and for that matter, uh, the MOH sector. It should be a holistic thing. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ankara, for that. And then uh, we land on Prof. Boabing uh, for your closing remarks. But then I'm in the habit of tagging the question along. So <laughs> that will be, do hand sanitizers cause antimicrobial resistance? And if you can address that in your concluding remarks and also spice it up a little with generally, in summary, what the role of pharmacists can be. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Do anti uh, hand sanitizers cause antimicrobial resistance? Hand sanitizers are, you know, usually alcohol, hand rub, and things. These are disinfectants, so they are actually used in, you know, helping with the clean hands. So I would rather say that, you know, it may, and as we saw in the COVID time, it may rather contribute to infection. It's part of infection prevention structure, the use of um, hand sanitizers. It does not replace hand hygiene, you know, uh, but kind of an addition. So hand sanitizer does not cause um, antimicrobial um, resistance. Perhaps maybe what the question I wanted to find out is that can some of the organisms become resistant? It is possible. If we don't use the right concentration, you know, of the hand sanitizers, then it is possible that some of the organism can evolve and develop resistance. So again, the role of the pharmacist, you know, helping us to get the appropriate sanitizers, teaching the public, you know, the right way of using it as complementary, you know, to um, hand hygiene. Let's educate the public about, you know, personal hygiene. Also um, very, very effective, you know, in minimizing um, infections, including um, drug-resistant uh, infections. Importantly, you know, don't take antibiotics when you don't need them, all right? Antibiotics are used, you know, for treating 
you know, um, infectious diseases. So it is only should only be used when it is needed. And I think that the pharmacists should help in the community, you know, wherever we find ourselves, you know, Dr. Ankara said it, working in teams to ensure that we actually minimize, you know, the use. We have to, you know, it has to be responsible um, use and also, you know, educating the public. There's a, still a lot of um, problem with literacy, all right, when it comes to the use of medicines in general by the public and particularly antimicrobial. So let's step up. We've been doing a lot, but let's step up and don't let's limit it to the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Let us continue to educate the public about these important molecules and let's try and preserve it, you know, and use it responsibly. We should take interest in our clients, all right? People who come to us, you know, um, seek advice from us on medicines use, who get medicines from us. We should be interested in what is happening to them if they're having issues, you know, report um, back to us. And lastly, when somebody is sick, all right, don't treat yourself, all right? You may be doing a lot more harm to yourself. At the last minute, you come with an infection, it may be difficult you know, to manage, or it may be expensive to manage. If you're not careful, you may lose your life. On that note, I also want to add my voice um, to that of my colleagues in thanking the Ghana College of Pharmacists for putting together um, this program. Um, let us continue um, to um, work with all stakeholders and ensure that together we minimize the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Babin. Um, it is said that when you're having fun, time seems to be flying faster. And um, we've, we've a little over the time, but I think we've covered a lot of grounds and uh, been able to respond to a lot of the issues as well. Um, this is a, a notice to all the participants that the posters will be ready um immediately after the event is over so don't be in a rush just take the posters and then you conclude the the session um thank you so much for your time this evening i would like to hand over to yvonne um to take it over from here thank you so much and this so, an so, Anna so, my sorry brian from, somebody from asked me. a question yes i think you sent it to me that should should you stop he's getting scared about antimicrobial results so should you stop taking antibiotics altogether no that's not what we are saying <laughs> all right antibiotics are useful they are very very important it's an essential medicine it's life-saving but it should only be used when it has to should you stop taking it it may save it, his or her life also thank you so much for that that intervention i think that was a very useful question and then a uh, solid answer as well thank you for for that so um, over to you, Yvonne, for the next step. Thank you very much. Wow. This has been exciting. Our panelists have given us a lot of information, and the engagement level has been really great. So from all the discussions that have taken place, we know that pharmacists are contributing in very many ways in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. And I'm sure you will all agree with me that there is still a lot to be done. Perhaps as a start, let's all find out more about how we can contribute to the activities of the national platform. As pharmacists, we must continue to engage all our stakeholders, other healthcare professionals, community members, medicine suppliers, and policymakers. We must update our knowledge by being abreast with current research. And we must also engage in operational research and share our findings with our stakeholders to support good decisions and choices by all stakeholders. And let's be very careful and be very mindful to ensure that we practice proper infection prevention and control. The CW PAMS, I believe it was mentioned in the discussion is the Commonwealth Partnership for Antimicrobial Stewardship. And this program is designed to help us develop stewardship programs. A call is now open for applications. And so if there is any facility that would be interested 
in getting some small support with um, setting up their stewardship programs, please go ahead and do that. You can look for them on FET or CW Pumps um, websites. And let's not forget, we are meeting again on Monday 21st and on Thursday 24th to engage the general public and other healthcare professionals respectively. To be great if you can all join us. And I will say a big thank you to all our panelists for sharing these nuggets with us. You are just wonderful. We knew we couldn't go wrong with such a, a strong panel and we have been proven right. Thank you to our moderator for such wonderful work in moderating these sessions. Thank you so much to all participants who have made this meeting so exciting and engaging. Hopefully, we have all done our pre-tests already. And so with our post-tests coming up, we'll be able to get our CPD points. And our final thanks go to the almighty God for making this meeting possible. Now our call to action. Let's commit ourselves to do our part, each of us, in this fight against antimicrobial resistance. And with that, I'll say a good night to us all, and may God bless us all. Good night. Good night. Nice weekend, everyone. Good night, and thank you all. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, great panel. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye.